A PG cop kills the mother of his two children and then kills himself tonight. You'll hear her family talk about how she tried to escape. And tonight a woman is dead and her parents and her sister remain detained for it. Also, we'll tell you about a terrifying home invasion in Ontario Village. Plus, police say they have no blame in Ruth Ferguson's death. You'll hear why they're not taking responsibility for her panic attack. And the PSU will get back Hilltop. You'll hear from the Prime Minister on this one. We've got details of these and other stories in our newscast for tonight, Thursday, November 22nd, 2018. Good evening. With your news, I'm Indira Craig.
Tonight, two children aged two and four are without parents after they lost both parents last night in a murder-suicide. Police Constable 438 Steve Anthony Ferguson killed his common-law wife and the mother of his two children, 30-year-old Josephine Hamilton, and then shot himself in the head. It's another inconceivable tragedy, but the kind we've seen before coming out of relationships with a long history of abuse. And this one fit that description right down to the terrible end. Here's more from the police and from her family. This home on Faustina Zuniga Street in Punta Gorda Town is where the horror unfolded last night. On the 21st November 2018, around 10.45 p.m., acting upon information received of shots fired on the Faustina Zuniga Street, water supply area, Punta Gorda Town. Police visited the home of one Steve Ferguson, a police constable attached to Punta Gorda Police Station. Upon arrival, the body of a female person who was later identified to be Josephine Rosalie Hamilton, a 30 year old housewife of the same address sitting against the wall motionless and the body of a male person who was identified to be Steve Ferguson a police constable attached to Punta Gorda quick response team was seen lying down face up in a pool of blood motionless Ferguson had shot her three times in the head and then turned the service 9mm pistol on himself. And she was seen with several gunshot type injuries, two to the top of the head and one towards the left eye. While the scene was processed, four expended shells were found whilst five live rounds were found in the magazine. Um, what police know so far is that there seem to have been a dispute prior to the incident occurring. Another dispute of very many, the couple had in a turbulent nine-year relationship which produced two children. Those children, who are just infants, were in the home at the time when the tragedy unfolded. There were two infants as well as two teenagers were at home at the time of the incident. Are you all aware what may have triggered it? Have there been, um, have any of them been out quote unquote socializing? No, at this point in time, um, the investigation is in its early stages, so we are trying to determine what exactly um, caused the incident to have occurred. Hamilton had told her family she wanted to leave Punta Gorda. Uh, she told me that she will be home soon, and she's supposed to be supposed to fuck herself and call to we because she, we have, I have several um for his Jakarta that me and she talked about what she will what she will do when she came to believe that she will find a job and she will um send her daughter to school. She had plans to leave him more. I I guess yeah. I guess it's time more leave her. I think that the things that she was going through make make it just get set up. I think that where I as far as I know. What was the trigger for this horrible event? Like he wants to hurt her, Allah, she was, he must tell her, he, she must tell him, like, oh, oh, since you want to push that kind of person, eh, all right, I will leave. I, 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 I like could say that that, that would happen yesterday night. Mm -hmm. I like could say that he must, she must have one left at that time, or already popped, and he knew about it. Or I like that he must have just, I don't know, I don't know what to say, because huh, it hurt, though. The police say PC Ferguson had not showed any signs of being suicidal or any kind of risk. He was a jovial person. He, is a, he was a team player. He did not display any sign of anger, any sign of wanting to hurt himself or wanting to hurt anybody. Now two children are left without parents. There were four children in the house, the two infants, which the couple shared, his teenage son and a nephew. They were all taken into the care of the Social Services Department. 
Ferguson had been transferred to Punta Gorda at the beginning of July, and Hamilton joined him shortly after. He killed her with his service weapon, which he kept on him as part of the quick response team. The police department issued a statement saying, quote, the commissioner of police, Mr. Alan Wiley, the senior ranks and file of the Belize Police Department, extends their sincere condolences to both the Hamilton and Ferguson families. Tonight, a farm caretaker is recovering from a vicious stabbing attack while his employees, employers, that is, an Ontario family, is left devastated. This is after yesterday's early morning home invasion at their Prayer Mountain Road home. It happened around 6.30. An American woman was at home with her kids. When robbers broke in, Courtney Weatherburn went west to find out more from a neighbor. Here is that story. Today, this hilltop home in Ontario Village is locked down and vacant. The family fled after a terrifying home invasion yesterday morning. A trio of robbers stormed in, held them hostage and attacked the caretaker. Early in the morning, whole family was there except for the men in the house. Matthew, his name, seven kids and a wife and, and caretakers. It, it's uh, several people there that take care of that. And uh, three people came and they were holding the family and they stopped the father of the caretaker the father yes uh, stopped almost to death because he was taken in cr critical condition home says she was at home when she heard a gunshot on the hilltop yes it was a gunshot we heard that my, my the guy who works for me we knew something is going on we drove there but police was already there when we we came According to Hum, this is the second time the family has been targeted in recent months. First time, uh, as I understand, it was like war zone. They took everything from the house, everything, uh, computer, everything. And everything that they didn't take was on the floor, and they even took the battery from the car. Was the family there at, uh, in that they time? They were in Mexico, everybody. Only caretakers were there, and caretakers said they didn't hear anything. But yesterday's holdup really has the family shaken up. And as you said, the wife and children, they're all, of course, traumatized. Uh, they are really, I mean, he took them out. As you see, he left the, the horses, he left all the, his animals, and he, they just, he said, I have to take care of my family. Reporting for 7 News, I'm Courtney Weatherburn. According to Hom, the American couple adopted seven Belizean children and they had been living at that hilltop house for about a year. Hom says she was also targeted a couple weeks after the hilltop home was burglarized the first time. She says she wasn't at home and robbers broke into her storage shed and stole some expensive tools. But with quick police response, she recovered some of those items. Today at the press briefing, police gave more details in this home invasion. They said that four masked men entered the family home and assaulted the American woman and her son. Here's more from the head of National Crimes Investigation. We were in quick police were called to Kamalote village, um, an area known as Prayer Mountain, where they visited the home of a 36-year-old American woman um, who reported to them that Shortly before 6.30 a.m. on yesterday's date, um, she was awakened by four dark-skinned armed male persons who wore masks, two of whom were armed with firearms, whilst the remainder were armed with knives. Her home was entered, where in the process herself and two of her children were forced into one of the room and in the process um, she was hit in the head with one of the firearms where she suffered an injury and also her son um, received minor injuries after being choked by one of those assailants. In the process of the commotion her caretaker um, came to her aid and he too um, was beaten by those persons where he received several stab wounds. He was transported to the Western Regional Hospital where he is in a stable condition. Um, at this point in time, police is seeking one suspect 
in connection with this investigation and we are following several leads. The police say the robbers got away with cash and electronic items. They also confirmed that this is the second time this Ontario home has been targeted. A 32-year-old Camelote banana vendor was knocked down and killed yesterday evening. The victim is Edwin Naharo, also known as Rokiel. It happened at the entrance of Belmopan. An employee of Invictus Solutions Limited captured the aftermath in this video. Naharo was on his bicycle heading home when a Joseph Penner hit him over in his Dodge Ram pickup truck. Courtney Weatherburn has more. If he wasn't out selling bananas, Edwin Nahara would be at his zinc shack, right next to his mom's wooden house. He dedicated his life to taking care of her. But now, Gloria Nahara is on her own. My grandma, she really old and she the only one we used to help her. Nahara was knocked down and killed yesterday evening after five in front of Yim San restaurant at the entrance of Belmopan. Information is that Naharo had finished chopping a yard in Salvapan and was heading back home on his bike with a puppy when this Dodge Ram struck him. The family believes the driver was speeding. And when we reached the um, police station, they told us that the man that actually don't say that, he, that my uncle had the fall, but we don't think that he had the fall because he always used to drive the balloon pan and always got a bump and nothing never happened to him so I don't understand how that happened and usually goes on the bicycle always on a bicycle never the taxi or nothing always the on bike people then said and he never have the fall but I know that they have the fall yeah I know that the man was a speed because they always like speed up and I hope police just try investigate because this we don't want to make it stay like this justice that's all they want for their loved one. Yeah, we were close friends. I have known him about 12 years now. Yeah, and it's very sad that he's gone now. Reporting for 7 News, I'm Courtney Weatherburn. Naharo didn't have any children. He had been living in his mother's Kamalote yard for about 10 years. And police have arrested and charged a Dodge truck driver, 20-year-old Joseph Penner, for causing death by careless conduct and driving without due care and attention now. Before he was charged this evening, the police gave a statement at the press briefing, not directly saying whose fault it was, nor if Penner was speeding. Belmopan police was called to the scene of an accident on the Hummingbird Highway, um, just outside Belmopan, near one of the roundabouts. Where upon arrival, a black and white Dodge pickup was seen on the right hand side of the highway, which was southbound, whilst a little bit um, in front of the vehicle, a Hispanic male was seen on the road um, with apparent head and body injuries. The deceased was riding his bicycle in a northerly direction. However, um, traffic was congested. I believe that some work was being done on the Rowing Creek Bridge, hence causing the congestion in traffic. As a result, he swerved across the highway in order to go to the other side which resulted in him being knocked down. The driver of the pickup at the time was one Joseph Penner, 20 years of Agua Viva, um, which is somewhere in the area just outside Belmopan. Penner was taken to court and granted bail of $10,000. The case has been adjourned until January 28th of 2019. A post-mortem examination has confirmed that 35-year-old teacher Ruth Ferguson died from a heart attack. This from a woman who had no history of heart disease. But as we told you last night, the mother of one did have a history of panic attacks. And she was having one of them when police showed up at her school to effect a bench warrant on Tuesday. The warrant was to commit her to jail if she didn't pay up instantly. Those perilous circumstances and the added embarrassment of being taken by police into a city bus to go to court 
through the longest route possible may have all added up to induce an extreme panic event which her family believes led to her death. Today, police said the incident is under internal review, but added that the officers didn't do anything wrong. Right, that, is, that matter is being investigated. Um, we know that the post-mortem is scheduled for this afternoon for Ms. Ferguson, and um, we will um, proceed with the investigation on the, after the conclusion of that post-mortem. Um, okay, no, but is it, I know statements have been taken from the principal of the school, I'm told. Um, is it an internal investigation that has been launched or criminal? Is it like a CIB matter? No, it is not a CIB matter. We are investigating a death. Um, however, um, it is an unfortunate incident, like I mentioned. But at this point, there is nobody liable for. Um, we don't think that there is any liability on behalf of the officers in regards to Ms. Ferguson's death. Like I said, the post mortem will shed more light on the circumstances. Now, as we told you last night, process serving is what the police do to carry out lawful judgments from the court, and they do so on behalf of banks, law firms, loan sharks, pawn shops, and other establishments who are trying to settle a debt. To our knowledge, the police are privately paid to carry out this service, but Ferrofino said it is a public duty. There are warrants that are subsequently um, taken out after judgment has been made in regards to cases and um, these officers get those warrants from the courts and they execute them. They are more so mandatory that they execute these warrants. They are not paid for it. Um, okay. it, is, it is part of their duty. Okay. It is okay. part of their, their duty as the um, officers working in the courts. Since then it is uh, some type of public responsibility are they, would they use a police mobile? Because the allegation is that Ms. Ferguson was taken in a bus. The, 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 the circumstances is, um, the, the case is being looked at. Um, we're not going into any details in regards to that. We'll wait and see what comes out of the investigation into why they use the city bus to take Ferguson from school. Ferguson's family has retained an attorney to sue the police. San Juan villager and 26-year-old mother, Katie Isenia Ramirez, died from asphyxiation caused by a hemorrhage of the pancreas as a consequence of abdominal trauma. Basically, the examination suggests that she was beaten up really badly. And the suspect are her own family members, her sister and her parents, who tied her up and gagged her after a drunken dispute over a man, reportedly. The head of national crimes told us more. She was observed with um, injury type um, marks to her foot, her hand, and I believe her neck. Um, our investigations so far have shown that she was at home along with other family members on the set date sometime around 4.30 p.m. when they were socializing, um, which eventually ended up in a dispute. And as a result, she was restrained by um, those whom she was socializing with. And at some point, she was seemed to be unresponsive. And, her, and as a result, she was transported to the Independence Polyclinic, where she was later pronounced dead. Um, so far, police have three persons in custody from whom statements have been recorded from. Those statements were submitted to the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions for which we are awaiting her directive. So those persons, um, we understand, are her relatives? Yes, they are. Um, do you know the nature of the dispute? Um, no, at this point in time, I do not um, know the nature of the dispute. Her family members remain detained and have not been charged pending advice from the DPP. We take a break now, but when we come back, the PSU will get back. Its hilltop headquarters will tell you how the Prime Minister intervened for them. Don't go away.
For most of last week, Bamopan Mayor Khalid Bilal and Bamopan City Council dominated the news cycle after the story broke that they had sold off the hilltop property that the public service union had called home for almost 18 years. By now, viewers know the two sides of this dispute very well. The PSU's hilltop headquarters was a property for which the union was granted a lease, which should have lasted 20 years. The Bamapan City Council is the owner of the property and in 2017, they checked their records noting that the PSU had long defaulted on lease payments. The PSU's counterpoint to that is that since 20, 2001, they've made payments of between 50000 and 60000 But the council asserts that the PSU can only show records of only four payments totaling $2,000. So the council treated it as a lease in default and they sold the land to a Chinese-owned shell company for $400,000. This dispute was quickly gaining traction, putting the Barrow administration on track for another union fight. So the Prime Minister stepped in and today held a meeting with the leadership of the PSU to find out if a resolution can be reached. The press was at the Lane building where these talks happened and when the principals exited, it was with the news that the sale of the land will be reversed and that the PSU will get back their hilltop headquarters. Here's what the two sides had to say to us about their discussions on the topic. This is the negotiation team that was assigned to meet with the PM this morning in order for us to address the sale of our hilltop. To give an update, we, the meeting was a productive one and we have found means and ways how to move forward as it relates to the sale and see how best we can get back our hilltop. So for an update as it relates to whether we're getting back the hilltop, it's one that we're going to need to do some more discussion and negotiation and share what had took, taken place today with membership. What was the Prime Minister's position in terms of either the points that were raised or the position that you guys took in the discussion? Well, the position that we took was one whereby just sharing the information as it relates to the negotiation that, we, that was ongoing with the City Council. And so that we were able to share with PM for him to understand the direction that we wanted to take. They will put out a press release this afternoon and I don't want to preempt that too much. But I will say that we agree that the objective is to restore control of that hilltop property to the PSU and I have proposed a way to make that happen and we are both sides absolutely confident that in consequence it will occur. I don't want to get into the details of the methodology, but I can say with absolute certainty that we are going to be able to procure the restoration of that hilltop property to the PSU. So the Prime Minister's intervention in this dispute possibly allows for an amicable resolution of the very first national controversy that the Belmopan mayor finds himself in. We asked the PM, who has publicly applauded Belial as a promising young politician in the UDP, about the mayor's road to recovery from the fallout for this one. Here's how that conversation went. Doesn't this sort of cast a black eye on the municipal government in Belmopan for the manner in which it went about uh, selling off the property? Well, there, 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 there have been criticisms and um, I would have to concede that notice, in my view, should have been given to the PSU before the sale was agreed. I do not 
pronounce at all on the merits of whether the council was entitled to sell the property. In fact, let me say distinctly and directly, that was the council's entitlement. But whatever the disagreement was, it was common ground that the PSU ought to have been given the right of first refusal, and according to the council it was, and there was this inability to come to terms. Let's accept that. Even so, before the council actually sold, I think it would have been preferable if they had given the PSU notice by way of what they might have been framed as what they might have framed as an ultimatum a last chance opportunity is it regrettable for you that one of the young rising stars of the UDP is caught up in this particular controversy of course because I've been on record as saying that I think Khalid Belial is the future of the United Democratic Party but the course of politics, like the course of true love, never did run smooth. Um, I am hoping that Khalid will be able to recover from the political fallout of what has gone on. In fact, I am certain that though it may take some time, he will recover because he's an extremely bright savvy, energetic, well-meaning individual with a good heart and a good soul. So I am confident he will recover. The PSU will now hold membership meetings at the branch level to report back to their membership on how today's discussions went with the Prime Minister. We'll keep following to see how the dispute continues to play out. The press also asked the PM about that hot button issue of Sanctuary Belize. That group, along with about 24 other entities, including Atlantic International Bank, are named in a civil complaint by the Federal Trade Commission. The complaint names Sanctuary Belize as a massive real estate investment scam, which has defrauded hundreds of U.S. investors. A court in Maryland granted the FTC an order shutting down the scam operation. It's a black eye for Belize because the properties are held on the City River Wildlife Preserve, a privately owned not-for-profit set up by the Prime Minister's law firm. Today he told us that the greatest concern is for the domestic banking system, that there is not be any contamination by association with Atlantic International. Number one, the wider jurisdiction. The wider financial secretary is in no difficulty. The central bank has made sure to be in touch with the principal uh, correspondent banks that service the domestic banks in particular in our jurisdiction, and we're fine there. With respect to the particular difficulties that Atlantic International Bank Limited is facing, I just want to express the sincere hope that they will be able to work through the difficulties with this American federal agency. People should certainly recollect that this is not a criminal complaint. It's It's a civil liability type proceeding, but it is nevertheless extremely serious. When we talk about AIBL, we're talking not just about a bank that has been able to entrench itself in our offshore banking sector, a bank that has had a stellar reputation. We're talking about the fact that locals 
are in the main, the owners of that bank. So of course, it strikes me that all Belizeans will want to wish the bank well. In terms of exactly how they are going to handle the situation, really that is a matter about which I think they uh, should speak to the media and the public. Yeah. Are, you, are you concerned about the fact that international media has cited it as unfortunate that your firm is, um, has worked along with the scammer? Well, I don't know which international media has said that. Uh, if the international media did, uh, that strikes me as a pronouncement of straw, of, of, of no substance. What I saw was that one of the companies was incorporated. The legal work of incorporation was done by Barrow and Williams. My God, man, that's what lawyers do every single day. If there had been any suggestion that Barrow and Williams was somehow involved in the operations of these companies and what the federal agency describes as the scheme, that would have been a different matter. But so that's really so not, not concerned. About not at all, no, no. It is reports say that a Maryland court has extended the temporary restraining order over the Sanctuary Belize development through a lease at least February 2019. Latest filings say, quote, the FTC and the receiver entered the defendant's business premises on November 7, 2018 and found new evidence of the FTC's allegations and significant corroboration, including documents showing the relevant individuals had the roles identified by the FTC in its pleadings and telemarketing scripts showing the defendants were making the relevant claims to consumers. We also asked the Prime Minister about this year's Christmas chair, which he and his government are preparing to arrange once again for UDP ministers and PUP parliamentarians. We've seen a memo from the Financial Secretary to the Ministry of Human Development, Social Transformation and Poverty Alleviation, which is dated November 5th. In it, the FinSec noted that $650,000 has been approved for the government's Christmas chair program. We asked the Prime Minister about it today, and here's how that conversation went. $25,000 for uh, the elected ministers, and half of that for the representatives, the elected representatives of the opposition. Sir, there is always that concern raised by the opposition that there is not equity, in that they get half of the amount. But we are the government. There must be a prize for being the winners of the political contest. And there must be some recognition of the fact that as ministers, you have to work uh, not politically, but in terms of the duties of office and of government, you have to work harder than the uh, members of the opposition do. So I think that is equity, and I have no apologies to make. The UDP and PUP area reps will use the money to provide small gifts for their constituents. So what will Pablo Marin, the UDP Curzal Bay area rep, do with his Christmas share allocation of $25,000? Well, that's what we asked him today when we caught up with him at another event. He said that he's already planning his annual Christmas parade and a Christmas party for his constituents, where he will be providing a few gifts for his voters. All ministers, uh, what I know, will get 25,000. Um, the non-members um, or the opposition will get half the amount, as usual. Um, my money is allocated already for, for me to do the Christmas party for the kids. And you know I have a big um, Christmas parade. It's very expensive. I, I have about 25 um, People already um, um, put their names to be part of the program. We have about eight marching bands. That is about maybe eight to nine thousand dollars only on that. Um, the toys that I buy is about maybe fifteen to twenty thousand toys, and I try to give toys and I invite everybody from Corozal B. There is always this concern that um, the government maybe 
spending money that it could be placed elsewhere. I think you, the time for us to, to look at the, the finance, um, we do have a lot of things that we need to do. But Christmas has always been a, a part for us to give the, to the kids. There's a, a lot of kids that don't receive even one toy. Um, so what we do, we give them a toy. We, we, we make them feel that part of the love um, of, of the country and the nation. I, I don't see a waste of money. When I see a child smiling, when I see a child taking a, a toy and playing with it, um, I don't see that as throwing away the money. The PUP Sky Northeast Representative Orlando Landi Habet also commented today on the Barrow administration's Christmas chair program. This year he was the first in his party to voice disagreement that once again the PUP area reps will only get half of the amount that the UDP ministers will get. He explained why. I believe that if the money was coming from the UDP coffers, that would have been fine. But if the money is coming from the government coffers, where all of us contribute to the economy and our taxes and everything else, then it should, then it should be equally distributed. That's, that's, that's what I think. Earlier this year, earlier, sorry, in this segment, we showed you how the Prime Minister was making nice with the public service union over their hilltop property. Well, you may know that he also intervened in the dispute between the Ministry of Education and the Belize National Teachers Union. You'll remember that this disagreement escalated to the point where the union took to the streets of Belmopan at the beginning of the month, bringing out 1,300 teachers and supporters for a demonstration. The two sides are now trying to resolve their quarrels over the union's concerns about hardship allowances. Proposal 22 and commuting allowances. Tomorrow, the Education Ministry officials will meet with the union's branch presidents to discuss the first concern over the teacher hardship allowance. They will make their case as to why they believe that the ministry's earlier assessments of some schools were incorrect. Today, the union president told the press that they are prepared to make their case to the ministry. We are meeting tomorrow uh, with the ministry personnel. Um, we'll be having our branch presidents and our executive um, attending that meeting. And we are hoping that at the end of that meeting, we'll be able to go over the list of schools, especially those that were downgraded, um, to see what kind of movement we can make on those schools. And this is not a meeting including the minister, right? Because he has house meeting. I guess so. Uh, but he has said to us that if it is that he is the problem, that he is willing to recuse himself from those meetings. Um, we've said to him that as the minister, he's the one who makes the final decision. So it is important for him to be in those meetings. Um, so, but noting that there's going to be a house meeting tomorrow, then we understand that he won't be able to be there. I think um, the ministry realized that this is a matter that is not going to go away unless we deal with it properly. And so I believe that with the prime minister's intervention, uh, maybe that was what triggered um, the change. And it's something that is good for us because we felt that we had to have the input of our members. After the resolution of this issue, the union and the ministry will then move on the other concerns of the teachers. We'll take a break, but there's still much more news ahead and we'll show you the reenactment of a drug plane landing with Operation Dagger. Don't go away.
Tropical Dagger. It sounds like a cool name for an action movie, but while it is not a movie, there surely was a lot of action for the entire month of November at the BDF's Camp Belisario in Cayo. Tropical Dagger is a regional training that brings together top security forces from Canada, Belize, Jamaica, and for the first time this year, Trinidad. Courtney Weatherburn was there for the final exercise, and here's her story. This man on the phone with the do-rag is a part of a heavily armed narco team. He's the point man in this operation, securing the airstrip and calling the pilot to land the drug plane. As the plane arrives, the men quickly gather to transfer the drugs to this truck. But the BDF and other special forces have been lying in wait, looking for the right time to pounce. And they did. The police swarm the area, search and handcuff the men, provide any medical assistance to those who were injured in the crossfire, and document any fatalities. This was just a short demonstration of what a successful drug plane interception looks like. It is the final exercise in a month-long regional training known as Tropical Dagger. It's a combined exercise that has been planned jointly between the Canadian forces and the relevant um, security forces units that are represented here. Presently we have units from Belize, of course, being BDF and Coast Guard, the Belize Police Department, um, have elements from Jamaica, from Trinidad. They started off um, doing some training first initially within the first couple of weeks and then for the November, right? beginning of November, yes, and then it culminated with this final exercise which is to incorporate all that they have, all the training that they've conducted to just ensure that they have they practice what they've learned. Could you go into specifics, details in terms of what uh, it was like for the entire month? It, they, they did some shooting, some coordinated planning, because we're bringing countries together who don't normally work together, or units, especially in Belize, who don't normally work together. So, um, as they mentioned, it's like singing. Everybody has to be work as one to ensure that it's all coordinated and it works. Based on your personal experience in Jamaica, what are some of the, the similarities that you see as it relates to the, the operation and the, the drug trade itself and how these cartels move and work? Well, um, the cartels, they have their own networks. Uh, and so, and they're always trying to keep ahead of law enforcement. And so what we're doing here today is, is making our, our good network to counter the bad network by training together so that we can operate seamlessly together to counter their operations. We are learning just as much uh, as our partners are learning in this case. Uh, so when it comes down to tips, uh, we are taking as many tips uh, from, from uh, those partners as they are taking from us. So it is really a partnership. And when it comes to drug plane interceptions, that partnership and cross-unit collaboration is key because sting operations like this one are very involved and tedious. If you notice the scenario plays out in a real-life scenario here in Belize, as this is what we train for, for real-life scenarios. So, Based on this demonstration, it seems like uh, ABC 123 operation, but that's not really the case in real life. If you remember, the captain just spoke and he said how long they took the plan, and it's just for a short period of time in terms of the action. So it all depends on how the scenario plays out. I mean, the surveillance team could have been on the ground for two weeks, for a week, and nothing happens. Or, as has been the case in Belize, the narcos land the plane and transport the drugs way before the police get to the spot, finding only burnt remains. But there are also cases like in September, where the Belize forces successfully intercepted a drug plane in Blue Creek, confiscated the drugs, and arrested and charged two police officers and two Mexicans. But even with these victories, the fight against the narcotics trade continues. In the Caribbean, we all have this drug issue, and this, the other countries in the Caribbean mm -hmm. suffer the same fate as us. So this is just to integrate all the units, should they be needed in another country, they can work together as one unit. Reporting for 7 News, I'm Courtney Weatherburn. 
Tropical Dagger began in 2012 in Jamaica. This is the third year it is being held in Belize. For most of today, members of the House of Representatives were at the sensitization forum organized by the National AIDS Commission and the Pan-Caribbean Partnership Against HIV-AIDS, PANCAP. They want to get the Belizean Parliament more involved in the country's HIV-AIDS prevention strategies. The plan is to stop the spread of this virus by preventing any new HIV infections in all PANCAP member states by 2030. But international funding for AIDS prevention strategies are not as bountiful as they were in previous years. So, the governments are being called upon to drive the country's national response to HIV AIDS. We stopped by the forum and spoke with House Speaker Laura Longsworth, who is still very active in the National AIDS Commission despite her role in Parliament. Here's what she had to say about the forum with the theme, What Can Parliamentarians Do to End AIDS? Today we are really sensitizing our parliamentarians about the work that it's needed to that's needed to end HIV AIDS by 2030. And I know people get nervous when we say that, but when we talk about ending AIDS, it means though reducing the infection rate, the new new infection rate. Every year we have too many people being diagnosed with HIV AIDS, and if you listen to the ministers. Uh, presentation this morning, he noted that our prevalence rate has increased from 1.4 to 1.9. And so he ended by saying we have lots of work to do. Indeed, we have lots of work to do. And why, why parliamentarians? Well, you, you guys know parliamentarians, you know, approve bills and they push through in the interest of the, of the nation. And so uh, they have supported us so far with a number of bills. Right now, the country needs to focus on ending stigma and discrimination. People with HIV AIDS are really stigmatized. Um, if some, some people are thrown out of their homes, some people are ashamed because if people know they don't, they, that they are HIV positive, um, they will talk about them. And um, so they, they don't take their treatment. Our problem is really one of a people problem. We've got to be more friendly to our people. We have to remember that it's a human rights issue. We want to move ahead with an anti-discrimination bill that will give people a le some legal recourse. For instance, somebody with HIV AIDS is thrown out of a house because they have AIDS. Then where are they going to live? Belize is very much on track. We have antiretrovirals free of cost. We have services free of cost. We have health services free of cost. We have mentoring services. And we've also been paying keen attention to our key populations, men who have sex with men and so on. The, the main concern right now is that funding is, is um, getting depleted. And what we are trying to do is sensitize Parliament for whenever we need finance, um, they will, will um, agree to it. But the main important thing is for us to um, pass legislations. You know, there's a lot of um, discrimination, stigma going around, and, and we need to remove that. We need to, to show the, the people out there that even though you have AIDS, that means that's not um, the end of it. Indeed, the Global Fund um, has reduced. We just completed a, another round of um, submissions, and um, three, four years ago, we got three point something million US dollars. This time we only got 1.9. And so we don't know if we'll have any more to get. So this is why we are racing against time, putting things in place, because we have to take care of our people. We can't we can't no we can no longer depend on external funds. We have to take care of our people. The forum began at 9.30 this morning and ended at 3.30 p.m. Next week is supposed to be exam week for the students of Mount Carmel Primary School in Benke, but a dispute between teachers of the school, the Catholic Management and the Teaching Services Commission could end up forcing the cancellation of classes for the rest of this week. That's because the teachers have decided to show support for several staffers who they believe are being treated unfairly due to a breakdown in communication between the management of the school and the commission. The BNTU president explained a few of the specifics to the press today about the dispute.
We had spoken to the branch president for Benke, and we spoke to, to the local manager, Deacon Cal, and he explained to us what the situation um, was there. I must say that we have received from the management in Benke the concerns that they have regarding these teachers that they're um, out you know, demonstrating on their behalf. We have sent those to Dr. Carol Bab so that she could look at the concerns that, they, that were raised and she could address them. So she has promised us that she will be looking into them. As a matter of fact, she spoke to, to the Concal, we understand, and she um, um, said that the ministry would be looking into the matter and trying to get it resolved. So from our end, we are working with the ministry to see how best we can resolve the matters. There are several issues, but I think the one that the, the, the teachers at the Montgomery were looking at was the fact the matter of the teacher, Ms. Um, Pitch, who was not granted uh, permission to continue to be in the classroom. Um, she had a, a license, and the license would have expired on September 9th. She applied and she was given a special permit, um, and special permit is granted on, on, on different bases. And so hers, I believe, was given because of her nearing retirement age. So she was given that, that permit, and so that was given to her from July, and it would have been um, effective September 10th or September 9th, the, the day of the same day that the license would have expired. So then she would have been qualified to be in the classroom because she had something valid um, um, as a teacher. However, it, it seemed there was a back and forth between the management and the commission in regards to submitting documents and doing interviews all over again as if though she was a new teacher. So that seemed to have been the issue and she was not approved, but she was in the classroom from September and she has not been paid um, by the government. So that's an issue that they are looking at. And then there are other issues in terms of, um, of their sick leaves not being approved in terms of, of um, long leave not being approved for some misunderstanding with long leave, some miscommunication back and forth. So those are the issues that we are aware of that we have forwarded to the ministry. And the president says this is a recurring problem, not just at Mount Carmel, but at other schools across the country. Here's how she explained why and how the deputy prime minister has proposed to fix it. While it might be a few at this point in time, these are issues that our teachers complain about very often. And it's not just the Benke um, branch or, or, or in that area, but teachers countrywide. And we've been having these issues um, reported for by our teachers and sometimes some management. And we, there are times when we cannot identify who really is at fault because the management would say, it's not us, it's the commission. The commission would say, it's not us, it's them who send in documents late. So it's difficult for us to determine and say exactly who is at fault. But we discussed the matter with the minister when we had that, that meeting last week. And the minister had promised us, um, I'm hoping that I can make this public, but he had promised us that the ministry will look into the matter and they will look to putting a um, specific person at the commission to deal with these cases so that the teachers would have a direct link to somebody at the office. They'll have a hotline of, of sorts where they can call to get information. Um, and so that one person then would be responsible for providing our teachers with answers as to whether the documents were received, um, whether um, a decision is being made on them, when they can get an answer. That's so that instead of the teachers having to call and not getting any answer from anybody. Tomorrow the teachers have a permit to protest and march. The underage teenager who allegedly attempted to rob Ying Long Shop in Unitedville last week, Friday, and got shot in the neck has been charged. You may recall that the proprietor of the store was also shot in the foot. Well, today, police charge this teenager for the robbery, the shooting, and another robbery that happened in Belmopan a week earlier. Police have since arrested and charged a 17-year-old for the crime of robbery, attempted robbery, and conspiracy to commit robbery. Um, he has since been transported to Belmopan, where he has also been charged for a robbery which occurred in San Martin, Belmopan, on the 6th of November. Is that the one at Thai Food Yes, it is. So he has also been charged for that robbery. Belmopan police have detained the principal suspects in a murder that happened over the weekend. In Salvapan, a 41-year-old from Salvapan and a 27-year-old from San Martin were picked up this morning in a pre-dawn operation. The head of crimes investigation says they are being questioned about killing 23-year-old Jermaine Sanker. The police is following several leads in respect to that investigation. Um, 
We have several persons in custody who we are interviewing today. They were brought into custody today. Um, so we will see where the investigation goes as a result of the interview with those persons. We know that, um, from what we understand, he is originally from Corozal but was living in Ladyville, but ended up somehow in Bermupan uh, where he was killed. Uh, anything as to what he was doing there? Um, no, at this point in time we do not know, but we know that he was in Bermupan previously. Um, about a month ago he was in Bermupan. Sir, are you all able to say uh, the reports that he had two broken legs, which were broken some time ago when he was fleeing, uh, pursuing police mobile? Do you know anything about that? Um, I believe, yes, he is the same person who was involved in a road traffic accident just outside Sand Hill Village. Um, I believe it was earlier this year or late last year. That we'll keep following the case to see if arrests are made. And Belize City Police say they have taken steps to clamp down on a hotspot for gun violence on Neil Penn Road. Two men were shot at the same address a few weeks apart. Fortunately, neither was fatally injured. But it's a problem area for police and they told us they have taken steps to ensure there isn't any recurrence. Is this related to the previous shooting at that same address of a relative of Mr. Tablada? Um, no, not at this point. Okay. Um, is there some like gang rivalry or personal rivalry? But well, we do know that there, there has to be some tension in the area and um, we are addressing it. No, we know there's a checkpoint like right feet away. Is this a subject of concern for you all that violence continues to happen on Penn Road even though the police have a semi-permanent presence? Well, of course, but um, we have um, addressed the matter and we have put measures in place to, to um, stop any reoccurrence. And finally tonight, there is some good news if your vehicle uses regular gas. At midnight tonight, the price of a gallon of regular fuel is going down by... 68 cents to nine dollars and 95 cents a gallon the first time in months that it will be on the ten dollars no such luck for premium diesel and kerosene though they are each going to tick up by one cent per gallon and that's all we have for you for tonight thanks for watching with your news i'm indira craig remember that you can see a streaming video of this newscast at 7newsbelief.com or see DigiNet, the ultimate internet experience. Do have a good night. We'll be back here tomorrow.